What's up everybody, this is Cecil Alexander with Jazz Lesson Videos, and today we're going to be talking about um, some steps that you can take to master giant steps. Uh, but I would say that these steps really apply to any tune that has fast moving chord changes, which in jazz is going to be a lot of bebop tunes, but also a lot of tunes that are in the post-bop canon. So uh, compositions written by people like John Coltrane, Joe Henderson, Herbie Hancock, and Wayne Shorter. And we're going to be using uh, some examples from um, a resource that I released with Jazz Lesson Videos is entitled 23 post bop etudes so in this video we're just going to be focusing on the giant steps etude from that package but if you want to dig a little bit deeper we have um, some etudes in that package that are also over some similarly challenging tunes like inner urge and serenity by joe henderson and you can feel free to use the coupon code ca5 for an additional five dollars off so let's get into it. So I think the first concept that you can practice that will help with your playing over giant steps is the use of arpeggios. Not just arpeggios off the root of chords, but arpeggios off of the third, fifth, and sometimes seventh of different chord changes. So in this tune, we just have uh, major seven chords, minor seven chords, and dominant seventh chords. So just checking out some different options for major seven chords that are kind of inside the chord sound. You have an arpeggio off of the root. So I'm using B major 7, the first chord of the tune, as an example. So that'll be B, D sharp, F sharp, and A sharp. And then uh, the next arpeggio that you're going to have available is D sharp minor 7. So again, to B major 7 chord sound, this is going to give you the 3rd, 5th, 7th, and 9th. Uh, and that ninth will be a pretty uh, tension to lay on on that chord. So you don't have uh, arpeggio sounds available off of the fifth or the seventh, uh, unless you want to go a little bit outside of the chord sound, then you could think about using like a Lydian sort of uh, scale sound on B major seven. So that would give you F sharp major seven and A sharp minor seven. That F sharp major seven will give you five, seven, nine, and sharp 11, and the A sharp minor 7 will give you 7, 9, sharp 11, and 13. So for minor 7 chords, uh, the next chord type that we have in this tune, uh, I'll use A minor 7 as an example. Um, you have an arpeggio available off the root, uh, which will give you just root, flat 3rd, 5th, and flat 7th. You have an arpeggio available off of the uh, flat 3rd, so that's C major 7, that'll give you flat 3rd, 5, flat 7, and 9. And then you also have E minor 7 available. So that'll be 5, flat 7, 9, and the 11th. Um, I wouldn't really use the arpeggio um, di that's diatonically available off of that chord. That would be G major 7, just because of that natural six is going to kind of take away from the minor seven chord sound. And on dominant chords, our first dominant chord in the tune is going to be D7. Um, you have a lot of different options available. So you have D7, which will be the root third, fifth, and flat seventh. Uh, off the third, you're going to have F sharp, minor seven, flat five. Off of the fifth, you'll have A minor seven, which will give you five, flat seven, um, the 9 and the 11th, and then off of the flat 7th, you'll have C major 7, which gives you all of the available natural tensions. That's going to be uh, flat 7, 9, 11, and 13. And then you can also think about altering some of those different tensions in order to create alter dominant sorts of sounds. So for example, taking F sharp minor 7 flat 5, if I wanted to get a flat 9 sound on this D7, I could just lower the uh, top note of that arpeggio, and that gives me three, five, flat seven, and flat nine. And then I can apply that to all of the other arpeggios as well. Um, so off the fifth, doing like a uh, A diminished seventh arpeggio, and then off of C, 
doing a C diminished arpeggio sound. Again, that'll target the flat nine. But there are also some other arpeggio um, alterations that you can create to highlight uh, flat 13 or sharp 11. But a lot of those are going to be out of like melodic minor modes or harmonic minor modes. So when you're practicing through the tune, um, I think just starting with the arpeggios off the roots of each of the chords, you're going to be able to get a lot of mileage out of that. But then you eventually want to get to the point where you're able to voice lead using all of the different arpeggio options. So um, you might have some Something like this just as a simple line right just over the first couple of measures I have B major 7 on the B major 7 chord and then on D7 I have um, a minor 7 so again that's gonna give me the fifth flat 7 9 and the fourth and then on um, G major 7 I just did a G G major 7 arpeggio. So that's going to be 7, 5th, 3rd, and then the root. Uh, and then I could keep going with that exercise if I wanted to. So extend the line a little bit. So I did a B flat 7 arpeggio descending from the flat 7th on B flat 7. And then once I resolved to E flat major 7, I used the G minor 7 arpeggio, so giving me the 3rd, 5th, 7th, and the ninth. So here's an example from the resource that I mentioned that's going to be using some arpeggio sounds over the changes E flat major 7, and then C sharp minor 7, F sharp 7, going into B major 7. So we start off with the 4th of E flat major 7 happening on a strong beat, and we resolve to the 3rd using an enclosure. And then we do a G minor 7 arpeggio. So again, this is an arpeggio available off the third of that chord. And we also add an eighth note triplet rhythmic variation to it. And then we have kind of an extended enclosure that's going to eventually get us into the flat third of C sharp minor 7. So it's going to sound like this. So we get into the flat third there. And then we use uh, an arpeggio variation. So going from C sharp minor 7 to F sharp 7. So this is called a pivot arpeggio. So we have E major 7, which will work over both of those chord sounds, C sharp minor 7 and F sharp 7. Over C sharp, it'll be an arpeggio off the flat third. On F sharp 7, it'll be an arpeggio off the flat seventh. So we take that E major 7, which is E, G sharp, B, and D sharp. And we put G sharp, B, and D sharp down the octave. And then we also add a chromatic approach before the second note and play the remaining three notes as an eighth note triplet. So you end up with this as your full line. And then eventually resolve into the third. So the next concept that you can practice on giant steps is the concept of melodic cells. So melodic cell um, is generally thought of as like a you know four to five note shape um, that you can move through different keys. You can move through a uh, scale if you want. But my favorite way to use melodic cells is to outline fast moving chord changes and also to get a lot of um, harmonic information in in a short amount of time. So probably the most common melodic cell and a really common melodic cell to use over giant steps as well is is the one, two, three, five melodic cell. So if we start on B, thinking of B major seven again, one, two, three, five would just be B, C sharp, D sharp, and F sharp. On D seven, a one, two, three, five would be D, E, F sharp, and A. On G major seven, it'd be G, A, B, and D. And then on B flat seven, B flat, C, D, and F. And on E flat major seven, E flat, F, G, and B flat. So you could, in theory, play through the entire tune just using this one, two, three, five melodic cell or changing it to fit uh, the minor chord types as well. Like after that E flat major seven, we have an A minor seven in the tune and you would do one, two, flat, three, five, right? But you can also um, start the uh, one, two, three, five or the reverse of that cell, which is a five, three, two, one off of different points of the scale. So a good example would be on B major seven, rather than just playing one, two, three, five off the root, we can also play it off of the fifth. So this is F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, and C sharp, or the reverse of that five, three, two, one. 
my favorite place to do this is on dominant chords. So um, on D dominant seven, you have a one, two, three, five off the root. You also have a one, two, flat three, five off of the fifth. Um, so against the chord sound, that'll give you five, six, flat seven, and nine. Uh, you also have a one, two, three, five off of the flat seventh. So that's flat seven, root nine, and 11. So you have a lot of options with dominant chords. Uh, with minor chords, taking A minor as an example, you have off the root, as I mentioned before, off the flat third. So that'll be uh, like a C, one, two, three, five. Um, you could use it off the fourth as well, and more of like a modal context, if you were to really highlight that natural sixth sound. And you also have one off of the fifth. All right, so that'll give you five, six, flat seven, and nine. So using the package as an example, um, the very first phrase that we have over the first couple of changes of B major seven, D seven, G major seven, B flat seven, and E flat major seven, it's gonna sound like this slowly. So you'll notice in the second half of the first measure, after going up this B major seven arpeggio, starting from the seventh, I go down a whole step and voice lead into the ninth of D seven, and I go down a five, three, two, one melodic cell off of that fifth. So, so that'll kind of be like playing A minor over D seven, which will give you the nine flat seven, six or the 13th, and then the fifth. And then I'd land on the flat nine of G major seven, but resolve it immediately in the next beat. And then I use this cell um, or this little phrase on B flat seven. So that's kind of another uh, melodic cell that people will use a lot aside from the one, two, three, five is this little chromatic idea because that's something that Coltrane would use quite a bit. So this is like one, seven, um, flat seven, back up to the root. Uh, and he would use it specifically on dominant chords quite a bit. Uh, it's kind of borrowed from like the dominant bebop scale. So melodic cells can be a really useful way of thinking of breaking up longer lines. Like if you were to transcribe a phrase from John Coltrane's solo, you know, rather than thinking of uh, one phrase as being just this big block, think of it as being the culmination of a lot of smaller pieces being put together. So there's an idea over the one chord, there's an idea over the five going into G major, there's an idea over the uh, G major chord, uh, and so on and so forth. I think you get a lot of mileage out of breaking up vocabulary that way because then you can apply that to other tunes a lot more easily. So the next concept is going to be that of delayed resolutions. So delaying resolutions um, in standard tunes is a really great way, I think, of kind of blurring the lines of the harmony. Um, so a good example would be if you have a five to one progression or a two, five, one, rather than resolving to the one chord right on beat one, you can still be on the five chord. So in this line that we're going to take a look at, which is going to happen over E flat major seven, and then A minor seven, D seven, G major seven, we're going to use a delayed resolution going into G major seven. So we start on E flat major seven with a five, three, two, one melodic cell land on the seventh, um, and then we get into the flat third of A minor seven. We go up uh, sort of a C major seven arpeggio and extend it up to the nine. Go down chromatically into B flat, and once we hit that B flat, we're already on G major seven. So rather than um, you know trying to resolve that idea immediately, I just keep going with this um, like D altered line, basically. So that against G major seven is gonna give me all of these wacky intervals like sharp nine, seven, flat seven, flat six, and then finally resolving into the fifth on beat three. So again, this is a really great way of creating tension, but it's also a really great way of um, just kind of getting outside of the changes without really doing anything that's too complex. And you can do this in a lot of different places in giant steps. And I think just the key is um, eventually coming back in on that chord sound. So the next step 
um, to getting giant steps under your fingers and in your ears, uh, I would say is singing the bass notes to the tune. So this may sound kind of silly, but I do think that once you get the sound of the harmony in your ears and especially the sound of the root motion, it becomes a lot easier to connect the things that you know to the harmony. So I would start by taking small chunks of the progression um, and just trying to first play them on the instrument and then match what you just played with your voice. So I would go through the first um, four roots of the tune. So we have B, D, G, B flat, and E flat, and then try to match that with your voice. So, da, da, do, da. and then do the same thing with uh, the next section of the tune and kind of just break it up into smaller chunks like that. So I'll just skip past that because I've done that sort of practice already and I'll just do the entire bass motion of the tune. So there's B is my reference pitch. Do de da do de do de da do da di da da do da do da da do da 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 di da at B. So already that's going to do a lot for connecting the things that I can already hear melodically to the harmony of the tune again. Um, and if you want to take this one step further, I would even try um, scatting simple solos over the tune um, once you have the bass notes together. But the idea is you're thinking of the bass notes as almost being like a secondary melody. You know, you hear people talk a lot about um, soloing through standards and having the melody of the tune kind of playing through your head to keep track of the form. But this will help keep track of uh, the harmony and it'll let you know where you can um, anticipate the harmony, where you can delay it, what sorts of lines you can fit in um, rhythmically and melodically and harmonically. So I hope you get a lot of use out of these practice concepts for mastering giant steps. But remember that these will also work over any tune that has fast moving harmony. Uh, I mentioned a lot of tunes in the post bop canon, but also a lot of more contemporary tunes by um, composers that are alive and around today um, will also apply. Again, if you feel like digging a little bit deeper into this topic, feel free to check out my resource with jazz lesson videos, 23 post bop etudes, and use the coupon code CA5 for an additional $5 off and feel free to like, comment, and subscribe, and I hope to see you next time.